Don Johnson, are you here? All right, you, you have a question about armor. Uh, yeah, I uh, wondered uh, how effective was the use of spaced armor? Spaced armor, I guess that's Vorpanzer. Well, the, uh, the Germans had the Schurzen, but those were designed specifically to defeat the uh, Russian anti-tank rifle rounds because the uh, German tanks were all more or less all designed up to a certain period with 30 millimeter armor on the side and the Russian anti-tank rifle was very widely distributed and they were getting a lot of uh, casualties and damage from side impact from anti-tank rifles by putting in the 5 millimeter, 5.5 millimeter Schutzen plates that was able to defuse the incoming anti-tank anti round from the anti-tank rifle and uh, solve the problem. In fact, um, um, there may be some people here interested in the uh, Panther II, and the Panther II project was cancelled because they solved the problem of defending the side armour on the Panther by putting in those small Schutzen plates along above the wheels. And that was a much cheaper solution than designing a completely new tank. But down in, uh, for, well, it was in Fort Knox, where, I'm not sure where it's it is. It's Benning anymore. now. Benning. Um, the Panther II prototype is there with a the normal Panther turret that was put on over here after the war. Um, but if you examine that, you'll see that the side armor there is uh, much thicker than the 30 millimeter. Um, as far as guards, spaced armor, well, they were, they were experimenting <coughs> on ways of defending the uh, vehicles against the bigger caliber anti-tank rounds. And originally they were, they were um, welding or bolting our 30 millimeter onto 30 millimeter, but then they realized they could get the same effect by putting a 20 millimeter a certain distance ahead of the 50 millimeter uh, plate. And you see that on the Panzer threes. Um, but the ideal is to have a single plate. Uh, uh, spaced armor in that context is, is, a, is a more complex arrangement. Any, anybody, uh, anybody else play with it, the Russians or the Americans? I don't recall any off the top of my head. The, the U.S. actually did ex experiment with spaced armor. The, the main thing that the U.S. Army was experimenting with, or, or the, the objective of the program, was actually to, to, to defend against uh, shape charge weapons, the uh, Panzer Schrecks and the, the Panzer Faust. There was um, work, for example, on what is called plastic armor. I've never really looked into its actual composition. I don't think it was plastic in the contemporary sense of polystyrene or something. I think it was actually asphalt and various other compounds. They actually found that it was quite effective in, uh, in degrading uh, that type of weapon, the shape charge weapons. The problem is, is that it added considerable weight to the, excuse me, to the existing vehicles, which is traditionally a problem with, sp with space armor. Space armor is oftentimes an adjunct. It's something that's added on later after the design has already been made. Adds a lot of weight. People don't like that. It has an impact on the reliability of the vehicle. Um, there, of course, was very extensive field use of what I could call spaced armor. It's not quite the same thing that Hillary was describing. It wasn't armor plate. But as you know, in 1944-45, um, the U.S. Army was very concerned about the poor armor pr uh, protection on the Sherman tank. And there were all sorts of improvised methods to protect the, um, the Sherman tank. Some of it was actually done by ordnance officers, where there was actually some <laughs> deliberate effort to try to figure out the best thing. The, the most obvious method was sandbags, um, but there were for, uh, many other um, attempts. There was the use of concrete. There was actually the use, um, strangely enough, of German-style spaced armor. In fact, um, there was an effort made in the winter of 1944-45 to examine the, uh, the final style of shirts and the, um, the, the mesh style rather than the, the, the plate. And there were actually a number of vehicles fitted with it, and uh, test firing was conducted against it. Um, there was also a program to, um, to space out um, somewhat more akin to what the, uh, the Germans did on Panzer III, see how that worked. In most cases, they just didn't feel like they, that they had the resources to do it. They usually felt that it, it, it did have some effect. The most active program was with uh, 7th Army um, uh, down in Alsace. They did a whole series of tests, but once again, uh, they, they, they ended up sticking, uh, sticking with the most conventional method, which was either sandbags, although the difference in 7th Army was that they created special racks to put them in. So you'll see photos of Shermans with these very elaborate racks around the turret and around the hull side full of sandbags. That's usually 7th Army. Um, and sometimes they would change the sand fill in the bags for concrete. Um, they also experimented with um, putting various devices on the uh, glacy plate 
and then pouring concrete into it to get sort of the equivalent of uh, reinforced steel. So there was a lot of interest in it, but um, n not a lot of uh, uh, active industrial style space armor. Well, in, in mid-44, the Germans actually did a uh, research program on improvised armor, uh, and they looked at concrete, they looked at various other things, timber and so forth, and they looked at uh, using uh, spare track plates, which was a, a thing that the troops were doing in the field. But uh, as regards putting additional armor on the front, uh, they found that uh, putting track plates on the front of a vehicle actually increased the, ri the risk of your tank being penetrated. The, they, with uh, concrete, they established uh, a table that you had to put so much concrete on the front of a tank to give any additional protection that it definitely wasn't worth the increased weight of the vehicle. So in general, they were issuing um, bulletins to the guys not to be putting stuff on the front of the vehicle, that the normal armor was good enough for the purpose. But, you know, the guys in the field felt better when they had all this crap on the front of their vehicles. And, you know, if you feel better, maybe you fight better. And th that was actually the U.S. Army reaction, too. The official U.S. Army reaction, the ordnance uh, uh, personnel in, in the field in the, in the European Theater of Operations, was that most of the stuff just didn't work. They did do actual field tests of things like sandbags and concrete, those sort of things, and they found that it, they didn't work. But practically every one of these reports that I've read has a little postscript at the bottom. It says, but the troops find this very, very effective, and its psychological value outweighs its, the technical issue. And so the, with the exception of Patton's Third Army, it was widely accepted by the ordnance troops that it wasn't really very effective. But on the other hand, they weren't actively discouraged because of the psychological value of having that applique armor put on the, on the front. I, I mentioned Patton's Third Army. Pat, one of Patton's senior ordnance officers argued very, very strongly with Patton that they shouldn't do it. And you will see photos of Patton, um, mostly late in the war, mostly in April of 1945, when he gets up tank units like uh, 12th Armored Division. Uh, they're uh, uh, attached instead of 7th Army going over to 3rd Army. Um, him going over to tank crews and yelling at them about having sandbags. Well, it wasn't their fault. They didn't do it. These were not programs done by individual crews. These were done by units. And so 12th Armored Division had all of the tanks in their units with the sandbag protection as part, part of standard, standard procedure. And, and getting down to the technical nuts and bolts of this, what you have to keep in mind in World War II is that a lot of the early shape charge weapons, the Panzerfaust and the Panzerschreck, were not ideally designed as far as the standoff, the point at which the, uh, the warhead detonates. And therefore, by putting something further out, what tends to happen is that you make the warhead, uh, the Panzerfaust or bazooka or any other type of sharp shape charge, you actually enhance its penetration by causing it to detonate sooner. Uh, the, the jet forms better and penetrates better, and that's the technical reason why some of these applications, such as sandbags and concrete, really don't work well. In fact, they enhance the penetration of the shape charge warhead. Well, that seems to segue us straight onto the Henry Mohawk question. If one you last thing. All right, oh, on. it, one of the results that you see in battalion uh, records is that pouring concrete, they found, did not reduce the chance of the vehicle being knocked out at all, but it reduced the chance of the crew being injured. And that was very important to them uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah. I can understand that. Because <laughs> you got that whole concrete truck in Bovington. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a complete armored vehicle made of concrete. Um, but that was for the home guard. That didn't really count. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so the other question from Heat Charge is, uh, how much did Henry Mohawk influence the development of heat rounds, and when did high-velocity heat come into effect? I'll take the second part. <laughs> when did high-velocity? High, high-velocity heat come into effect. Well, go ahead, start with part two. If we don't have an answer to part one, we don't. Um, one thing that you'll notice if you look at heat weapons during World War II, they're generally low-speed projectiles, meaning things like Panzerfaust, bazookas, piots, um, and when they're fired out of um, artillery pieces or out of guns, they're generally um, things like howitzers, things like that. Now, the reason for that, and you won't see them in tank guns. You won't see, the Panther tank does not fire a heat round. Uh, the Sherman tank does not fire a heat round, the regular 75 or 76 millimeter gun. The reason is, is that in World War II, the fuses um, didn't act fast enough. They were con a conventional fuse. So what ended up happening, as you all know how a, a shape charge works, you have a, a copper cone and explosive behind it and you have a, a, a section out in the front and you have a, a fuse on the front. 
Well, what happens with the older fuse is that if it was going very, very fast, the time between the point at which it hits the enemy tank and the whole thing crushes in, before the fuse can detonate the charge, the shape charge, the, the copper cone is already impacted against the metal and crushed itself and therefore won't work. You have to detonate the copper cone before it impacts. You have to let that jet of metal form up. Now what happens in 1946-47 is a, a new development comes out, the piezoelectric fuse, which is very, very quick, so the point at which it hits, it transmits the signal down to the warhead and detonates the warhead quicker. So you'll see after 1946-47 that most armies develop shape charge warheads, heat warheads, that can be fired out of tank guns. But until that point, there's no, what the, the questioner called, high velocity heat. Okay, on the question, on the part about that Swiss uh, inventor, the, the advantage for the Americans was that he was, uh, he was licensing his, his invention for, uh, for foreign, uh, foreign use. Uh, the German army had its own technical team, which independently had discovered, had created successful uh, heat rounds for low, low velocity uh, cannon. And so without this Swiss gentleman, I suppose the, the Germans might have had a, a two year lead or something on shape charge ammunition, heat ammunition as the Americans call it. But once you, as in the case of other things like German magnetic sea mines and so forth, once you get one of these captured, uh, they're easily reverse engineered. It might have delayed the American use one or two years, guys. Do you think like that? But, but not, not, a, not a war changer at all. Right, I started out as a tank officer, so although we, we did a lot of training uh, initially uh, in the tank officer course, and this was back in the good old days for the, when the Marine Corps had its own school, Therefore, we were a nine officer course, whereas if you'd gone to Fort Knox, you might be in, in a course of 100 or more. And, uh, and in fact, Fort Knox, the Army course back then, had very little hands-on experience. The, the sergeants would drive the tanks. They would tell you, you, know, they, you didn't get to shoot that much. But we had a nine-man course with about uh, three to five training tanks available at any one time. So we all fought each other like cats and dogs to see who got to drive. And if you drove out, you didn't get to drive back. And, uh, and we had lots of ammunition to shoot in those days. And we got an awful lot of hands-on training. And of course, we did the pre-operation checks as well as the post-operation maintenance because uh, you know, the sergeants weren't going to clean up after us. So we, we, we finished the day just covered in head to toe with uh, grease and diesel fuel and we were just loving it. We were, it was, and it was California, so it was uh, very enjoyable in that regard too. And the genius of the Marine Corps, uh, being from Seattle, I spent all of uh, eight weeks uh, in 24 years uh, in, on the West Coast, so that was, that was my one big treat. Now, the rest of the time I was in uh, North Carolina and uh, Japan. But uh, I had a lot of good time uh, I had some good independent duty. I was assigned as an instructor in history at both the Naval Academy and, and Duke University Navy ROTC. So whenever I wasn't knocking over trees with tanks, I could be in my, my hidden profession and interest, which was uh, military history. So I had, a, I had a very good time. Yeah, the best time uh, is forever etched. Uh, we had the, in the M48 tank, which is what I, what I mostly uh, served in, later the M60s. The M48 tank had this terrible commander's cupola with a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on its side and leaving just enough space next to it for a 50 round box of, uh, of ammunition for the darn thing. And it was very difficult to load and manipulate. And once you got it set up, you could fire the 50 rounds, but then you had to put another box in there and, and somehow manage to move, move, work in this cramped space to, to get the rounds loaded and, and fire off some more. Only one time in my career did I ever manage to fire both required boxes in a tank qualification course, the uh, Table 8 
crew course, and uh, the tank commander is responsible for the uh, for that gun in the course of fire. And you're supposed to fire both boxes. Only one time they'd ever do it. It was a night course, ironically, even more demanding. But uh, what a feel, what a feeling of accomplishment! I had no knuckles left, just blobs of uh, flesh and blood. But I actually managed to fire off all 100 rounds, and uh, that'll forever remain in my head. I think. Uh, again, that was my little secret, was that uh, I liked reading books, not necessarily the thing every Marine thinks of as his first priority. But they were my companion on those long uh, cruises for deployments for six months in the Mediterranean or a year on Okinawa. And I, I liked military history, and I, so I managed to get the Marine Corps to sponsor me for the master's degree. And then I, on my own, I finished the PhD in modern Europe. Uh, in 1984. Kept it a closely guarded secret for all but my closest friends. So I had a, a real affectation for it and I resolved that once I got off active duty and had more time I'd write the books and articles and I never had time to do. So I've done about a dozen now and enjoy every bit of it. The writing's a chore and the research is just a hell of a lot of fun. Still am. Still working on the M103 book. I've got a Korean War book uh, coming out in May on the Marine Brigade at Pusan, 1950, and I have a few other projects in the bag. Okay, well, we are going to change, a complete topic change. The question is, how do you repair a track in the field? <laughs> There's a lot of cursing. <laughs> <laughs> Tools and cursing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, des describe the misery of, uh, of changing a track there, Rob. It's <laughs> the mechanics of it are absolutely no different to what you would have if you were sat on the hard ground in the vehicle park. Where the problem does in come in, are you going to be on your own, um, i.e. your crew of four, whereas in, back in the base you might have the whole troop working on it. You've got the weather, you might have the tactical situation, um, it depends how the track is broken, is it just a case of knocking a link out? putting a link in and putting it back in. The hardest problem I found, uh, I had to replace both tracks when we were in Canada. It had been raining, the ground was soft, and it just would not join up. So the weather had a big effect on it. If you could find somewhere hard standing, it was not a problem. But the actual mechanics of putting the link back in, joining the track back up, were no different than having it on a hard standing. It was just the weather made it so much more difficult. It, there's a... Uh actually a, a small sample of, of reporting from the 741st Tank Battalion, which was one of the but battalions <coughs> equipped with DD tanks and two of its companies for uh, D-Day. And most of those tanks sank on the way to the beach, but, but uh, 22 battalion tanks wound up on the beach and they did very detailed crew reports on what happened after they landed. And of 22 vehicles, seven had track problems. And so you, you, you have this nice pool of what you do when your track goes bad in battle, when people are actually shooting at you constantly. In four of those cases, the crew just abandoned tank. They went and hid behind it or in a hole or something like that, which sounds like a reasonable solution. <laughs> in, in, in two of those cases, uh, they, they tried to fix it on the battlefield and one crew was ultimately able to accomplish that, and the other finally gave up and left it and came back the next day when nobody was shooting at them. <laughs> and in the final case, it was a tank dozer, and they, they didn't actually break a track. They threw a track in the uh, soft sand, and the driver was trying to nudge the tank around to get the, uh, the track back on, and he threw his other track. Uh, so he set about rocking the vehicle back and forth, and they both popped back on, and he was good to go. So as somebody uh, said yesterday, sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, I was never that lucky with a track. <laughs> never had luck. Um, all right, Yuri, where are you? Go ahead. So my question is, at the end of the war, the uh, Germans implemented all this new emergency kind of desperate technology. One of them is a rumor of a self-stabilizing barrel or auto-stabilizing is there any truth to that? Yeah, there, de there definitely is. But I think what one has to always remember with these things is that there, there's an awful lot of engineering experiment going on. Um, and 
the, the, there would be half a dozen projects on the stabilization side, but I don't think that they really had the technology to actually get it to work in those days. Um, but they were definitely interested in it. They, and they were combining the stabilization with autoloaders. They had several designs of autoloaders uh, for those. And I spoke earlier on about the short 75. They actually had a new concept of fighting vehicle, which would be a small vehicle with an autoloader on a short 75. And that was the nearest to being ready for production. But really, from, you know, from late 44 onwards, they are up against it. There's, they just do not have the materials or anything else. It doesn't stop the engineers and people back in the uh, drawing office coming up with all sorts of wonderful things. I would, I would think there's about, about six or seven projects for stabilization were current. Now, I, I do remember seeing some uh, footage by the British Army, uh, I would say, about the early 50s of a Centurion with two-axis stabilization, which looked all very impressive on the firing range, on the staged uh, environment, that it was driving around and actually hitting targets at at least 40 yards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when, when did, uh, was, was it actually in Centurion, it actually got a proper two-axis stabilization system? Centurion had it, but the problem was, as you say, Showing it as a film for um, propaganda, it looked brilliant, the tank going along and the gun staying like that. If you were sat in the gunner's seat, the power operation of it, you had to lay, try and lay the gun on. Well, it was, it was stabilised, but you still had to try and control it with an elevation hand controller, which your hand was up here, your other hand was down there, and your head is in the sight. Um, an ergonomic nightmare. Um, the only way you could hit target was close your eyes, hope, pull the trigger, and it might go in the general direction, which was classed as quite good. We moved on then, if we ignore Conqueror, because it had a, a totally different sort of stabilisation, we had Chiefdom, which moved up a stage, and you, originally you had the traverse and elevation all in one. Again, stabilised, and again, it was very much hit and miss. If you were aiming for a barn door, you probably would have been lucky. We didn't really get into the idea of being able to hit on the move at speed until we come on to um, Challenger 2, which has the stabilised command site and gunner sites. That is a whole generation away. But for the generation that we're talking about in the question, you were controlling it, um, and it was very, very much hit and miss. So, so you said uh, Conquer had an entirely different uh, stabilisation system. Nice, big, heavy tank, good, stable firing platform for shooting on a move, right? Conquering was never designed to shoot on the move because, as we said earlier on in the first session, it was designed to sit back and take them out. But they found out that, well, they decided, very long gun, very heavy breech. If you start trying to move like that with no sort of um, protection, you're going to cause damage to the elevation gears, the Travis gear. So what was built into it was a sensor. While you were firing, the gun kit was running. All the power was up. As soon as Conqueror set off, and you reach 1.5 mile an hour, the trip would switch, and in would come the stabiliser. Um, admirable system, because it meant the gunner didn't have to think about it, he didn't have to select anything. The big disadvantage, and it was the reason why company commanders hated the thing it, tactically, is that as soon as it did that, the gun went like that. The gunner had no control apart from a few degrees like that. So consequently, the Centurions would creep into a fire position, really low down, guns tactical, Roaring up behind them would come Conqueror with a gun in the air, waving around, and until it stopped and it took something like 15 seconds for the system to come back into control, the gunner couldn't do anything, so you've got the Conqueror up there <laughs> waving like that. So it was an incredible nightmare, but the system worked. It did what it was designed to do, um, and as I said, Conqueror was never designed ever to fire on the move. It wasn't its job in life. Yeah. I think stabilization was one of those many ideas that came before it was time. Uh, the United States Army in 1945 had already had one-axis uh, uh, one stabilization, of course. There are lots of projects in Army ordnance for, in 1945-46 that are initiated. Automatic loaders, gas turbine engines, I'm not making that up, and, auto, and uh, various types of stabilization. Uh, armor piercing discarding Sabo, which we'll never do until we buy the British gun. All these are in active uh, pursuit in 1945-46. <laughs>